training, we're gonna be talking about five self-defense moves to end the fight in seconds. I want you to learn how to defend yourself using practical techniques that are gonna work, not just a bunch of fancy things that are theoretical or require a lot of moving parts. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is an elbow strike. I'm gonna move the bag around just a little bit so that you can see which kind of elbow strikes we're talking about. I'm gonna make them a little taller. The first one is going to be a horizontal elbow. Imagine that your hands are up, you're in a better position, you step back, you say, step back up, don't touch me. He keeps coming in, and then you're gonna bring that elbow in as hard and as fast to the side of his face, to his temple, or to his jaw, or into his body to try to stop him. Now your goal is to remove or destroy something to make him stop trying to hurt you. The first thing you can go for is his operating system. If he's knocked out, you don't have to worry about much else. But you're not gonna just strike once, you have to strike multiple times. The first technique from this position, my hands are up and open, I have them between me and the threat, is just driving this elbow in. And you can see that when you move your body forward and you accelerate, you accelerate into that strike, you can hit with a lot of force. Hello everybody, hello Steven, hello Doug. But I want you to practice this basic technique. We're gonna put the hand on the top of your chest and you're rotating through your shoulders and hips. Now you're moving in two directions for an elbow strike. One is forward and the other one is coming around. A lot of people make the mistake on the elbow, they just come around and they miss their target or they just sweep by their target. But you have to move forward. Hello Alita, it's good to see you. Coming forward and in. So if I were here, my hands are up between me and the threat. I always put myself in this position. I make eye contact, I tell them to back up defend myself. As soon as I realize I don't have a choice, I'm going to try to go first. I want you to have first mover advantage. That means hit him before he hits you when you know you don't have a choice. So if your hands are up and open, you always have them in this, what's called the flinch block. From here, I'm going to bring this hand into the chest as you're moving forward and you're turning. So notice what's happening is you're not going to pull it back and then strike. You pull it back you're no longer protected here if you move in while you're turning you're moving as you're turning you're going to close that distance striking the side of his face with so much force and power you can knock somebody out from here you're going to throw this one and then throw that one always bringing the hands back into this protected position you want to keep him off of you at all costs so you're going to strike here strike here you can strike one two multiple times coming into the side of the face hard as you can with pure uh, uh, intensity. Oh, hello, uh, good Aaron's watching from West Day just down the street, but coming in and striking over and over. That's a horizontal elbow. We're still talking elbows. The next one is gonna be a vertical elbow coming up. Think about under the chin or striking straight here. Uh, Doug asked if we prefer fist or open hand, striking with the elbow. Um, so in this position, your hands, are starting open. I always like to have the hands open. This is the flinch block. Your hands are up. It looks like you're saying stop because you are. Back up. Anybody videoing with their camera, the security cameras, the um, people watching across the street, or somebody who's a witness who later is gonna testify that you were defending yourself, the other guy was the threat, will say he had his hands up, he was saying stop, he said back up, he said I will defend myself, and then he had to smash him with pure intensity and force and pop something in there, turn off his operating system. He had no other choice. He broke his jaw, his teeth came flying out the side of his mouth with that hard, fast elbow, but his hands were open. So I say open hand, and then when you strike, bringing it here, I like to keep it open because it forces me to remember that when your palm is down, this whole bone in the elbow strike, there are two ways to elbow strike. One is traditional, like a Muay Thai, Thai kickboxing way, where you're using the tip and you're actually cutting them it's really nasty. I've had my nose split this from here to here with an elbow, and then I had to glue it shut. That took a while. I thought I was gonna have a flappy nose, but it, the glue works. So if you have to get your nose tapped, uh, don't have them sew it, have them glue it. Anyway, this hand here forces you to remember, keep that palm down. The first way you can strike is here. Hello, Jack, it's good to see you. Um, yeah, uh, Jack asks, is the non-striking hand pulling him in? Absolutely, Jack, reach up and grab the back of his head for self-defense and strike a little bit, right? Kind of hold him there so that he can't, once you know you have to defend yourself, this is self-defense, that gives you more balance, that gives you more force. Think about two cars head driving head to head. 
But when your hand is here, instead of tipping or hitting with the tip, you're going to hit with this whole bone. It doesn't matter. I want you to remember that because if it's life or death and you choose to remove his breathing permanently, you can step in and using that, striking into the throat. If he had a knife and your hands are up and you didn't have anything except and you're too close, you couldn't run, you couldn't hide, you're going to fight. You can take this elbow and instead of going for his temple, st stick that right there and Jack, grab him and drive it through his throat for self-defense. Now, the second elbow coming up the middle and think of sternum, think of the bottom of the chin, but you're also starting in this position. You're not going to pull it back and strike. You're going to drive your body in. This is why practicing is so important, driving it in and up and lifting off the ground with your whole body. Use those powerful legs to drive that into him for self-defense. The next kind of elbow strike, you're gonna take your hand and bring this up here and bring it down. Thank you, Jack. Jack says, love the content. From here, striking this way. You know what it is, Jack, for all these years, we've been training with each other and there's a component of martial arts that's missing practical self-defense. In other words, we train all the techniques. We can kick, we can punch, we can grapple, we can do elbows, we can do knees, but there has to be a mental training that goes with it, a basic principle. The first principle is self-defense, situational awareness, pay attention to what's happening around you before they get too close. Number two, get into a better position, hands up between you and him, create distance. This hand here will stop him from getting too close before you can bring that elbow or up like that and stop him. Or the third way, bring your elbow down, I call this the chicken wing and driving it here. So from here, it's the same thing. Notice your hand is still in contact. Maybe your hands are on his chest or his shoulders. My basic rule is if he puts his hands on you, you put your hands on him. This is especially for women who get shaken a lot, right? The guy grabs him and starts shaking him. As soon as you put your hands on him, you're not shaking as much. You've created a brace. From there, you're gonna make him stop shaking you, bring that elbow up and drive it down. Situational awareness is number one. Number two, get in a better position. Number three, ask yourself, what can you remove or destroy? Now there's, there are two books. Um, Oh, strolling Shubham Dian says, why am I teaching at 2.17 at night? It's two o'clock at night where you are. It's uh, four in the afternoon where we are. Somewhere in the world, it's midnight. Somewhere else, the sun's coming up. Somewhere else, the sun's going down. But I'm glad you're here training with me. Your hands act as a brace. You're gonna bring your elbow up and turning your shoulders and your hips. Again, going in those two different directions. Yeah, and that's what I was saying, Alita. It says, like in Tim Larkin's book, I put a link below you want to read Tim Larkin's book, When Violence is the Answer, it's the best book on self-defense I've ever read. It's the first link. Second link is Tony Blower's Spear System, which is where I get this bracing motion. This is called the flinch block as he defines it. I learned this a long, long time ago at one of his seminars and then uh, doing the military training. We did it again and again and again, but it makes sense. It's the most sensical thing that I've ever learned in self-defense other than what Tim Larkin writes. Right. So those two things, the only things that ever make sense. From here, create that distance, bring the elbow up, driving down and into smashing into the temple, into the jaw, into that clavicle, break his clavicle, you can't use that arm, but bring it down with force. You can uh, put them together, bring one up, bring one around, bring one down, bring one side over here. And then my favorite from here is up and straight down. Now, if someone grabs you and they start to bear hug you, you're not gonna be able to pull your hands out, but sometimes if you turn your shoulder, you can lift it up and then drive that straight down into that clavicle or into the top of the head. Uh, Doug asks, when you strike, are you in a shorter posture and then uh, straighten up? It all depends, Doug, that's a great question, but I think the answer is, it's like, it's like footwork. What is the footwork that you use for self-defense? That doesn't matter, just stand up, get your feet under your body, whatever makes sense. I like to think of it, Doug, as like, a lion chasing a gazelle, right? When that lioness, it's usually the lioness that takes him down, sometimes the lion, when he goes through the air and he's twisting his body and he snatches onto the neck and they go twisting through, he's not thinking about stance and footing and posture and this and that. He's doing what comes naturally. And that's what I wanna focus on in self-defense because that makes the most sense when I teach it. And then what I notice is the more you practice it, your body starts to adjust and your body figures it out. So I'm not saying that the one way is better than the other. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure as you described it, shorten and then lengthen. That makes sense. And that's probably correct. 
but don't worry about that. It's, it's, we want to keep it super simple because I want it to work. Now, after elbows, there are a few other elbows. I want to show you one more that I find extremely important, and that's the reverse elbow. He's behind you, especially he puts his hands on your neck. He starts choking the life out of you. Hello, Garen. You bring the elbow higher than his hands. This is the key. If your elbow is below the hands and you turn into him, he's going to wring your neck. If you bring your elbow up, it's going to pop his hands. His hands will do this. He'll have no choice. doesn't matter how big he is, how small you are. When your elbow comes up and you turn these big core muscles, you're going to pop that off. So you're going to lift it up and you're coming this way. So I'm going to, he's here, he's choking your neck. You're going to lift it up and you're going to turn and strike into his jaw, his temple. If he's too far back, knock his hand off and then smash with that fist. That's just an extension of this elbow. But this elbow placed on the jaw has knocked a lot of people out. Standing away and just stepping in. Now, again, two things you have to do for self-defense is turn your body and take that step when you come back. Three things, really, for maximum power extension, extension of the arm, extension of the elbow, extension of whatever the technique, and then turning the shoulders and hips. And then the last thing is moving your body into the attack by taking a small step. So he's behind you, his hands are on your neck. Immediately lift that elbow, come up, smash his jaw, maybe come down, hit him in the solar plexus, do it a couple times, go one side, go to the other side until he's on the ground and then you're safe. Now that's all for elbows. That's the first of five self-defense techniques. The second is gonna be the palm strike. And the palm strike will end the fight in seconds if you can bring it right in and smash his nose, the blood comes out, he starts to water. It's a lie that smashing through the nose sends the brain, the, the nose muscle, uh, nose bone or the cartilage into the brain and then he dies. I learned that when I was a kid. I think a lot of you did. A lot of us did, right? That's not true. That's a myth that's been debunked, right? But what you will do when you palm strike somebody right in the face is you will create a lot of pain and discomfort and you can break their nose. The blood does come, their eyes do water. They do start choking on their own snot and spit as you come straight forward. Now there's a proper way to do the palm strike and that's to pull the hand back towards you. So from here, it comes back towards you and out a little bit. So right here, back toward you and out a little bit. That exposes these five little bones right here, which are a really powerful, strong part of your hand. And then you extend that right into his nose, smashing. Yeah, Alita says, same, heard the same thing about breaking the nose, goes into the, the brain, they die, that's not true. But that doesn't mean don't do it. Just understand that what you're gonna do. You're gonna palm strike here. You can also palm strike into the body. If you think about cutting the body in half, and you have all these ribs here and a big chest and a hard muscle, but you come to the bottom, then all of a sudden that stuff gets a little bit tender and that's more muscle and there's a floating rib down there that will detach that can go through his lung and he's spitting up his blood as he can't catch his breath. And from here, that palm strike just comes straight forward. So, oh, I just knocked him down. Just bring it straight forward, straight into here. So either into the nose or into here. And you have two hands and you can also have your hands on right here and you can strike from this position. You can go fast and by turning your shoulders and hips, taking a little step with that foot and extending that arm, you can smash and break his nose. It does not take a lot of pressure to break his nose, bring tears down. Yeah, and Garen says anytime you bring tears, you affect his vision. That goes back to Tim Larkin's question, which is the first link below that book, when violence is the answer, you're using violence against him who's using violence to try to take something from you, your life, your dignity, your freedom, and you remove his ability to see, his ability to breathe easily, temporarily, or permanently. That palm can also go into the throat and you can end somebody's life. We already talked about sticking the elbow with a far forearm into that throat. Now that's the second of the five self-defense techniques when you want to end the fight fast. Ending the fight fast, number three. It's one of my favorites, it's the punch. Now I've punched for many years since I'm a little kid. I've done all of the Makiwara training, all of the smashing things and hitting things and breaking bricks and breaking rocks and smash, uh, punching walls and all that. And I'm not saying you have to do any of that. You don't have to become a bare knuckle fighter to be able to, to make your hands tougher. You can make them a little tougher. And one of you asked me recently, um, 15 years old, how do I make my hands even stronger? And I said, wait, when you're a boy, especially, you don't stop growing until you're like 18, 19, 20, and you have growth plates 
in your bones between your joints. And if you deform that as you're growing up, it's going to be deformed permanently. So wait until you start smashing things with your hands until you're fully grown and then learn how to do it properly. I make some videos on that. Yeah. And, and then I'll teach you how to do the one inch punch. Um, the one inch punch is, is, is that liquid transfers of motion. Don't worry too much about the one inch punch. If you want a harder punch than Bruce Lee, and this is going to make a lot of people mad because they love Bruce Lee and I love Bruce Lee too. But if you want a harder punch than Bruce Lee, instead of practicing the one inch punch, the one inch punch, learn how to hit a heavy bag, right? Hit that heavy bag boom, and learn how to hit it from distance, not just punch and not this. This is not a heavy bag. This is a floor bag because I'm in a fancy office building and I can't hang things from the ceiling or it would shake the rafters and the shoe store next door, all the shoes would fall off and the tile store next door, all the tile would fall off. So we use these floor bags instead. It's just what we have to work with. But if you want real power, go to the gym where they have a heavy bag and when it swings away and it comes back and you hit it and it swings away and it comes back and you hit it. And by the way, if you're punching it and it's swinging all, you're doing it wrong. You want to it has to come back and then you hit it and then you start to develop real dense muscle and your bones change and your bone marrow changes. So that when you do hit, bam, you get that Mike Tyson knockout power. And I'll say it now. If you want a harder punch than Bruce Lee, go for a Mike Tyson punch. It's either a one inch Bruce Lee punch, it man, could it man beat Mike Tyson? I don't think so. Not in their prime, not if they're bo uh, boxing, right? Maybe if their kicks involved or something else, but learn how to do a boxer's punch and you'll be knocking people out. So the punch, let's talk about where you're going to punch, right? You can hit the hard bony face. And if your hands are nice and strong, you can break his nose, you can break his jaw, you can break that orbital bone on his face, but you might also damage your hand. If you think about, there's an old rule in martial arts that says hard to soft, soft to hard. This is hard, that's the face, right? That's a big old palm strike or a palm slap. And I'm sure you've seen those palm slapping competitions are ridiculous. Bam, you just smash them in the head, you can box his ears force the air in, pop his eardrums, he loses balance, can't hear anything. You've just taken away his ability to stand, his ability to hear, but it's so soft to hard. That's the basic rule, right? There's that hard palm strike to the side of the head, but a punch, think about hard to soft. So think about the solar plexus. And I saw this lately. I love this guy. His name is Tony Jeffries. He's a boxing coach. He's got a, a gym out in Los Angeles called Box and Burn. We've got some friends that worked out there. They said, Hey, check this guy out. And uh, he's, he's a great, you can find him on here. I don't have a link below, but look for Tony Jeffries. And he was teaching a technique recently I saw, and I thought, wow, I never thought of that. And he, st he said, you know, when you're standing there and you're about to fight, take a step back and drive that punch, that reverse rear hand, that big right cross right into the solar plexus. So from here, stepping back and then driving. And so what happens is you step back and you turn the shoulders and hips. You're giving yourself proper distance. You're reaching through. You're literally punching into the soft tissue of his body. You're going to hit that solar plexus. His, his uh, diaphragm, that muscle that lets him breathe, is going to go into a spasm. It's going to lock up. He's going to think he's dying because he can't catch his breath. So from here, <clears throat> stepping back, you're just stepping back with that front, that foot. You're, hey, you're too close. Step back, give yourself distance, and fire that right hand straight, boom, straight into the body. You can also fire the front hand by bending, changing levels. One of my favorite techniques has always been a front hand punch, a jab, but not to the face. He's expecting this because you, you threw some here, boom, and then you drop down there and you drive that front hand. Notice that you're extending all the way. You're rotating your shoulders and hips. And in this case, you're going to take that short little step with that front foot as you boom, drive it right through his body, right to his solar plexus, <sighs> knock his wind out. He feels like he wants to throw up. It hurts. It can't catch his breath. Fights over, you win. So that's another way to end the fight in seconds. The next way, we've talked elbows, palm strike, punch. I've written, written down here so I wouldn't forget the knee. My, I love my knees. Thank you. Uh, Tony, great to see you. Um, everybody else, great to see you. I think Sensei Emmett, you're here. Sensei Emmett, we're getting closer. We keep looking at tickets for Ireland this summer. They are five times what they were before the big shutdown. And I'm not complaining because I know in Ireland, you guys got shut down for a year after we opened up. So I'm not going to complain about that. We're going to find a way and we're going to make it over. 
Now I'm gonna talk about the knee and I'm gonna change the camera. I'm gonna get it lower so you can see knee because we're going lower on the body. But don't get nauseous. Close your eyes if you have to. I always hate it when people move the camera while I'm watching a video. All right, I'm done. You can watch now. So from here, yeah, Doug says he used the palm strike, psychologically stunned the suspect and taking, Doug's a law enforcement police officer, retired police officer, boom, palm strike him, that stuns him enough, and then you take him to the ground. And here's the rule. If you control someone's head, <laughs> you ever notice why police officers are trained to take the head and slam them on the hood of the car or onto the ground? And I'm only laughing because we did so much of this training when I was in law enforcement years and years ago when I was a young Marine. I was a Marine, Marine military policeman. But yes, you can take someone, put their head on the ground or in control. If you can control the head, you can control the body most of the time. Um, yeah, Salty Boomer 61 says practical information. Thank you, Salty, for that. But the knee, I want to talk about the knee. Now, a lot of times, I'm, I'm going to change the camera angle one more time. Close your eyes if you have to. There we go. You're going to open them up. All right, the knee. On the knee, you've got a kneecap, the patella. You're not going to hit with that. That's a thin piece of cartilage, and you break it, and then you're in big trouble. There's a big band of muscle and tendon and stuff that comes here above the top of the knee. That's what you're going to hit with, either coming straight in or coming around a little bit to the side. Now, I have four brothers coming, or growing up, and we used to do something to each other, you know, sadistic brothers, called a dead leg. And you'd come up and you'd hit that sciatic nerve, which runs from the calf up to here, goes through here, down the other side, and man, does that hurt. Oh, Hayes Griffin, thank you so much for that, uh, that uh, super sticker. I love when you guys give me the super stickers. It's not just helping me pay the rent, which I <laughs> just sent a check for, but it also, because it keeps going up, but it also helps me to keep making these because it gives me some motivation. But that knee coming in to the side of the leg, so now you just lift it up. It's just a very fast, explosive motion. He's up here barking in your face. Your hands are, hey, you're too close. Bam, you can drive that knee literally into the groin. Now you say, but that's not very gentlemanly. We're talking about self-defense. We're not talking about old-fashioned uh, uh, Marcus of Queensbury rules. We're not talking about boxing. We're not trying to keep it polite. This is not a street fight. This is life or death. You just drive that knee. I like to drive the knee kind of like a round kick, but bring the knee in and smash that side of the leg. And I'm trying to break his femur for self-defense. If you try to break his femur for self-defense, he's not going to be able to chase you or run or even stand up if you bring that leg around. And that might not be the thing that ends the fight. That might be the first half of the second that ends the fight in seconds. And then after you hit him here and he goes down, maybe you're coming with a palm strike or that elbow to the jaw and that finishes him off or driving down, puts him on the ground. So think about driving the knee. You want to end the fight in seconds, throw a knee, either coming around sideways, coming straight in. Or you have your hands here, you can reach around and interlace your fingers or lock your hands behind his neck and then pull him down as you're bringing your knee up and really do some damage for self-defense. You can hit him first. Maybe you punched him a couple times or you did the palm strike, or you hit him with the elbow, and he starts to cr crumble for self you He's trying to kill you, he's trying to hurt you, this is self defense and you grab behind the head, and you finish him off with that hard knee strike. It's a way to end the fight in seconds for self-defense. Now, the last one is going to be a low kick. And I haven't done a lot of kicks lately. My hips have been killing me, although I've gotten a lot of relief by learning how to treat him right. But this low kick, this what's called an elliptical kick, is the kick I want you to think about. There are front kicks, there are turning side kicks, there are back kicks, there are round kicks. And notice I'm throwing them all low. We're not gonna do any kicks to the face, no Billy Jack. I'm gonna put the right side of my foot on the left side of your face, nothing you can do about it. <clears throat> That's fun, that's movie stuff. We're keeping all of our kicks below the waist and really below the knee. Then I'm gonna take this foot and I'm gonna turn it out by turning my knee out. So it's not coming straight, it's coming forward. It's gonna lift up. A little bit and I'm gonna push down and forward so from this angle see me from the side lift up push down and forward now I find that when I teach you this kick in person almost everybody gets this kick and is able to do it and says that I feel more balance on this kick than any other kick and it's just the way it's set up mechanically it's a real simple kick bring it up and push it forward bring it up and push it forward now think about where you're targeting. You're gonna hit his shin, and when you hit that shin, not only is it gonna hurt his shin, 
but it's going to hyperextend that knee, put him off balance. He's not going to be able to move forward. So if he's throwing, he's coming with that punch. You bring that knee, you smash him right there. Maybe your hands, hey, you're too close. Bam. And you just take a leg out. You can also do it at an angle so that his knee goes around sideways and back in a position. And you snap the tendons in his leg and the fight's over, you win. You end the fight in seconds with a low kick. Just bring it up, pushing it through. Bring it up, push it through. And again, this can be your opening move. He's barking in your face, he's spitting on you, he's coming at you with a weapon. You smash that and then bam, come forward and finish him off by leaning in and driving into the body. And I'm gonna bring the camera back up. Fair warning, so we can finish up real quick. None of these techniques are as important as the self-defense principles that go with them. And the first principle, again, in these principles, you can find them, some of them, because some of them are Tim Larkins. Um, and that's the truth about self-defense and martial arts. We've all been learning from each other for years and years and years. That's why I don't mind promoting other people, and I learn from them, and I change what I think is right, and when I learn something new. I've been in a situation before where I've been uh, fighting with somebody, and what I thought always worked didn't work because they weren't doing it the way that I wanted them to do it. And then I had to realize, oh, it only worked in the controlled environment before when the guy let me do the thing, and now it doesn't work anymore. Why is that? Did I all of a sudden get bad at the technique? No, the answer is when you train in just one style all the time, you get stuck in a little silo, you start to drink your old Kool-Aid, your own Kool-Aid, and you think that your technique is the only one that works. And then you realize these guys over here, they're not doing that. They're doing something different because they understand things differently. They just had a different experience. All of a sudden, you'll do one of two things. You either run back into your silo, lock the door, and say, get out of here, get out of my school. You're, no, you're not welcome here. Or you say, wow. I was wrong. I learned it this way. There's more ways to learn it. And that's what I've learned over the years. It's not good. It's not bad. It's different. It's different. What works with this person does not work with that person. My body is like this. I'm a big, wide, old, uh, muscular now. I've always been kind of muscular, but I've been losing some fat so you can see it a little bit better. But that's how I'm built. My bones are thicker than most people's bones. And they're older now than most people's bones. However, that doesn't make it. So when I do something, it looks a certain way. It's done a certain way. It works a certain way. For somebody who's made differently, which is everybody else in the universe, they're going to have to find their own way. You're going to have to find your own way. You're going to adapt and you're going to twist it a little bit. You're going to add to it. You're going to remove from it. You're going to make it better because it becomes yours. It goes through a filter. The filter is here in your brain. It's here in your body. And what you come up with is going to be better than what I taught you because you're going to train it and train it and then add it to other things and add different things in. If you can remember, it's not good. It's not bad. It's different. So what's the best martial art? I don't know. It doesn't matter what the principles are, what matter. Pay attention, situational awareness, right? What's happening as it's happening. Get off your phone, stick it in your pocket, right? When you're driving, stop looking at it. I teach these little kids. We've got to cross the street every day to go. And it's not a street. It's like just the driveway behind the building. And the parents have dropped off the kids and another part of the school for the little kids. And there's a mom every day. She's driving like this. And I think you just dropped off your precious cargo and there's all these precious cargo standing next to the road waiting to cross and you're going to drive by like that. And I think, I don't think she's doing it on purpose. I think it's so habitual. We get into such a habit. So identify and look at your own habits and become self uh, examining, examine yourself and ask yourself, what can I do better? What can I remove? What's too much? What's not enough? Where am I weak? Where am I strong? And figure those things out but don't get stuck in one spot. That's the whole point. And as you get older, your body will definitely change. And that's the reality. Stop fighting it. Stop complaining about it. Stop whining. Stop letting it be the reason or the excuse why you say, well, I can't do that anymore. I can't do that anymore. No, you can't. So what else are you going to do? You're going to sit there and watch your TV and Netflix binge and uh, eat Cheetos and drink beer or whatever. Or are you going to find a different way? redefine and that's what martial arts is supposed to be situational awareness number two get in a better position hands up and open that's the second link below that comes from tony blower's spear system 
It's like 10 bucks if you want to get it. It's like an old CD, but you'll learn a lot. And yeah, Elite Battle, Battle says old man strength. Develop old man strength as you get older. Old man strength, old woman strength. Um, and that's because it comes from here. It doesn't come from here so much because it's, it's a mixture of things. But learn the third, the third uh, sorry, self-defense principle, which is, <laughs> thank you, Doug. Um, getting dis distracted myself. Third situational or third self-defense principle is ask what you can remove or destroy. Take a breath first. What can I remove or destroy? This is the most important point of self-defense, which is where are you going to hit them, right? What are you going to hit them with? Where are you going to hit them? Are answered by the question, what will you remove or destroy? His ability to see, breathe temporarily, permanently. His ability to stand up. Maybe you take out his knee with your knee strike or that lower foot kick. That elliptical, we call this the elliptical kick, coming in to his shin, popping his knee to the side. He goes down like a sack of crap that he is because he shouldn't have attacked you in the first place. But learn the next uh, basic principles. Close with and destroy my favorite. It's violence of action. I saw it today. I was, I was working with a professional whose, whose job is to protect one person for a very wealthy, famous person. And the posture that that person carries himself with, the focus that he has, the situational awareness, his constant alertness, that's what you need, that's what I need, that's what we all need to be our own personal protection detail. Instead of waiting for someone else to come and save us, maybe they're not coming fast enough, maybe they're not coming at all, learn how to be your own uh, personal protection detail, but by adopting the same thing that professionals do, I saw things today that, that because I was paying attention to it and I was looking for it and I like, oh, that's what he has over there. That's what he, he's, pre he's prepared in this way. He's prepared in this way. His client is prepared in this way. So you make a list. How do you prepare yourself before you go out of the house? Before you, when you open the door and you look around and you see who might be lurking, right? And we say, well, well, then, you know, don't, don't want to be paranoid. However, if you're paying attention, I hope you're paying attention to what's happening in the world. The economy's swirling, wants to tell you which direction it's going, and banks are failing, and people are getting desperate, and, and people will start when people are hungry, and they're desperate, and they can't find things, they're going to take them from other people, and that can't be, that won't be you, that won't be us, because we will be prepared, not just with the physical self-defense, but all the things that support it, which are just important, just as important. But think about that. Write out some lists. How do you prepare yourself? What is self-defense? Self-defense against uh, a physical attack. Self-defense against a knife. Self-defense against an active situation. But self-defense against getting obese and having inflammation all the time that eats up your cells and causes all of this imbalance and makes you sick. And then when somebody comes up to physically, you have the mental training you're ready to fight, but your body says, no, you didn't, you didn't feed me right. You didn't exercise me. You didn't stretch me. You didn't drink enough water to keep me clean so that I can now defend you. So think about those. And I don't say those lightly. I know that it's hard to hear for all of us because I, I tell myself that every single day. I actually have write, written it down and I have a little checklist. And if I don't do my thing, it forces me to think, am I going to be able to protect my family? Because I chose, I was, and I was standing there today, I was hungry, I missed a couple meals today because I'm so extremely busy, and I'm standing at the Hobby Lobby, we had to pick something up for the kids, uh, school project, and the candy's all right there. And I'm looking at the candy and I'm thinking, which one can I get that's the least bad? And I know they all have corn syrup and I know they all have inflammatory ingredients that are gonna make my body ache, but I'm hungry. And it's got chocolate and peanuts, and I like chocolate and peanuts. And I'm looking at it, and I have to ask myself this question. Well, eating that, and I love peanut M&Ms. It's a big bag of peanut. And I, and I decided, this is what I'm going to eat. Because it's got peanuts in it. I told myself there's protein. BS, right? It's just garbage. But what can I eat? <laughs> well, eating this bag of peanuts tastes as good as being healthy and strong and capable of defending my family feels. And that's the question. You have to write it down. You have to write that phrase down for yourself. Will eating this, whatever it is, taste as good as feeling fit and strong and vital and youthful feels? And if it doesn't, then don't eat it. And, and, but, but you have to have that comparison that's in your brain 
You have to have that scale that you're ready to stick the M&M, &M, the bag of peanut M&Ms on and see if it's gonna outweigh being able to protect yourself and your family or have all that inflammation in your body. And that is hard to do, but you can do it if you make it a daily discipline, a daily habit. Anyway, you guys have been awesome. Thanks again for those super stickers. Thanks for this uh, super thanks. I know when you guys watch these afterwards, a lot of you guys are hitting that super thanks and you're help you literally are helping me pay the rent at a time when paying the rent has become very difficult. So I'm very extremely grateful. Um, yeah, and robots don't eat. <laughs> exactly. Their AI is not eating and the robots don't